Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kenosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Now, did you know, did you realize that the Word of God, the Holy Bible that has been preserved for us, is a timeless book, meaning that the same principles, the same truths, the same promises, the same hopes were just as relevant for Adam in his day as they were for Jesus and his disciples in his day and are just as much so for us in our day. And this will not be the message that you're hearing taught and preached today. For many are saying that the things that are found within the Bible relate to the culture and time in which they were written. But because those cultures and times have changed, then the Bible and the principles of the Bible aren't as applicable to us today as they were to the people then. And friends, this just is not true. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so I want to remind you and encourage you that as you read and study the Word of God, you are going to face challenges in this life where you must stand for truth. And you must realize in standing for truth that your vote is not going to be popular. Your position in standing for the Word of God is not going to be met with approval. But your duty as a follower of the Lord Jesus is to simply stand upon His truth. No matter what happens, no matter what they do to us, no matter how they threaten us, we stand upon the Word of God. Yes, in love. Yes, in compassion. Yes, in patience, meekness, and humility. But we stand upon the Word of God, knowing that its truths cannot be compromised and never change. Well, with that being said, we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible, and we have approached the story of the Judges. Now, we spent some time in the last video discussing this, so I won't lay much groundwork. We're simply going to pick up with the first judge today. And I want you to notice what, what is very interesting and stands out as you read through the book of the Judges. So let's look at Judges chapter 3, and let's begin at verse 5. Now, it says, The children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Now, these were the people that were supposed to be driven out of the land, and yet they still dwell among the people of Israel. Now, if you'll remember in Numbers chapter 33 and verse 55, we are told, if you will not drive these people out as inhabitants of the land from before you, then it will come to pass that they will be a prick in your eyes. They will be thorns in your sides, and they will vex you in the land wherein you dwell. And that's exactly what's going to take place. And it's most of all going to take place through the worship of these no gods, these false gods that the people want to cling to. And verse 6 explains how this is going to be done. The children of Israel took the daughters of the Hittites, of the Canaanites, of the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, they took these daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and served their gods. Now, if you'll notice when you read the writings throughout and the warnings throughout the Old Testament, you will never see, God forbid, the women to take men of the foreign nations to be husbands. The warning is always to the men not to take the women to be their wives. And the reason for this is clearly explained in two passages. The first passage is Exodus chapter 34, verse 16. And it says, If you take the daughters of these foreign nations and give them unto your sons, 
these daughters from these pagan nations will cause your sons to go a whoring after their gods. And then in Timothy, I believe his first letter, chapter 2, Paul says in verse 14, Adam was not deceived, but it was the woman that was deceived and therefore in the transgression. Well, if Adam was not deceived as Eve was deceived, then what took place? It was the seductive power that a woman has over a man. And that's what God is warning his people here, back to our text, that if the men of Israel take the daughters of these pagan nations to be their wives, through the seductive power that a woman has over a man, she will cause the man to worship her false gods. Now again, you're never going to see this with the women to the men. It's always the men to the women. Because there is a luring, seductive power that a woman can truly make a man do anything she wants, even serve her false gods. Well, verse 7, back to our text in Judges chapter 3, says the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they forgot the Lord their God, and they served Balaam and the groves. Again, Balaam is another way of saying Baal. It continues in verse 8 and says, Therefore, because of this act of disobedience, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And so he sold them into the hand of Chushan. They became slaves. Well, in verse 9, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord to deliver them from their oppressors. The Lord, hearing their cry, raised up a deliverer, and Othniel, the son of Kenab, Caleb's younger brother, led them into victory, and delivered them from their oppressors. Now the Lord was with Caleb, and for 40 years, in verse 11, the people of the land enjoyed a state of rest. But then Othniel died. And so look at verse 12. The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. They lost their leader, their physical leader, so they went right back to the only thing they knew. And again, as I mentioned before, this seems to be a natural tendency within us. Even Peter, when the Lord Jesus was killed, and what did Peter say? I'm going back fishing. He returned to the only thing he knew. He thought Jesus was gone. At this point, he did not realize that Jesus was coming back. And so he returned to his former lifestyle. And that's what we see taking place here. The children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so the Lord delivers them into the hand of the oppressor again for 18 years. But in verse 15, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So the Lord heard their cry, and he raised them up a deliverer. And Ehud, a Benjamite, led them into victory and brought them out from under the hand of the oppressor. And in verse 30, the land had rest again for four score years. This would be 80 years. Well, in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, The children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan. And realizing that they were being oppressed again, in verse 3, they cried unto the Lord. Well, the Lord hears their cry and raises up a deliverer. Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at this time. Well, in chapter 6, after Deborah, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. In verse 6 of chapter 6, Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. They're again under the hand of the oppressor. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And so God, in verse 8, sends a prophet unto the children of Israel. And the prophet says, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt. I brought you out of the house of bondage. I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, out of the hand of all those that oppressed you. I drove them out before you, and I gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the Amorites, those who dwell in the land, but you have not obeyed my voice. And so it is for this reason that I have placed you in oppression again, in a state of slavery, but because you have cried unto me, I have again raised up a deliverer for you. 
And Gideon leads them into a great state of victory. Again, they experience rest. They're brought out from under the hand of the oppressor. And in chapter 8, verse 32, it says, Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age. But in verse 33, it says, as soon as Gideon was dead, the children of Israel turned again and went whoring after Balaam. In verse 34, they did not remember the Lord their God. And so you should be seeing by now this repetitive cycle that is going on with the children of Israel. Even in chapter 10, after God has brought them many deliverers, in verse 6, it says again, the people forsook the Lord and did not serve him. And so the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of the Philistines. And they were there for 18 years. And in verse 10, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. But in verse 13, this time God says, you have forsaken me. You've served other gods. Therefore, I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. But the children of Israel said unto the Lord, we have sinned. They acknowledge their sin. That's the first thing we, we must do, friends. We must acknowledge that we have sinned. We have broken the commandments of the Lord. And so they say unto God, do unto us whatever seems good unto you. But we only ask that you would deliver us this day. And so now that they have made confession, notice what they do in verse 16. They take all their strange gods and they get rid of them. And they begin to serve the Lord. Even though he has not acted on their behalf yet, they're doing what they know they must do, what they should have been doing all along. And so God's soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. God sees their effort, and he's going to honor their effort. And this brings us to a man named Jephthah. Now, Jephthah was a Gileadite. He was a mighty man of valor. He was a warrior and he was the son of a harlot, and his wife bare him many sons. And when the sons grew up, they threw Jephthah out of the house, because his mother was a harlot. Well, Jephthah fled from the house, and he dwelt in the land of Tob. Well, in verse 4, it tells us it came to pass in the process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. Well, because the people are being attacked, and their great valiant leader has been thrown out, they go to Tob and they fetch Jephthah to bring him back so that he can lead them in battle. And so they say to him in verse 6, Come and be our captain so that you can help us and, and lead us as we war against the children of Ammon. But Jephthah in verse 7 says unto the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me? And didn't you throw me out of my father's house? Why are you come to me now when you are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, Therefore we turn again to thee, that you may go with us, and fight against the children of Ammon, and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. They're treating Jephthah the same way they treat God. When they need him, they cry out to him and expect him to answer. But when there's no need for him, when all in life is well, they have no need for God. Therefore, they don't recognize God. They don't serve God. And this is exactly the way they're treating Jephthah. And so Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead in verse 9, If you bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and the Lord deliver them before me, will I be your head? Will I remain your leader? Or will you chase me out again? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, The Lord be witness between us, if we do not so according to your words. Well, Jephthah, committing unto the people that he will become their leader and lead them in battle, in verse 29 it says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead, Manasseh passed over Mizpah of Gilead, from Mizpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And Jephthah made a vow unto the Lord, and he said, If you will without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, it will be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. 
Well, Jephthah leads the people in battle. They are victorious. The Lord delivers them into his hands. And notice in verse 34, Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house. And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels, with dances, and she was his only child. And it came to pass in verse 35, when he saw his daughter, the first one out of the house, he tore his clothes. And he said unto her, My daughter, you've brought me very low, and you've troubled me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord. I've made a vow, and I cannot go back. What he's saying is that you will be offered upon a sacrifice, a burnt sacrifice unto the Lord because of the vow that I have made. And notice what the daughter says in verse 36. She herself even honors the vow that her father has made unto the Lord to such a degree that she says unto her father, if you have opened your mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to whatever has proceeded out of your mouth. The only thing I ask of you, Father, in verse 37, is let me go for two months that I may wander in the mountains and be well my virginity. And so he said unto her, go for two months and do as you have stated. And in verse 39, it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. And she never knew a man. She died a virgin. And we're going to end there today, friends. But as we end, there's two things that we've learned from our lesson today. First of all, it is the nature of children, even spiritual children, to make a lot of mistakes. And when we make these mistakes, it is our responsibility to acknowledge our mistakes, confess our mistakes, seek forgiveness for our mistakes, and then do everything within the power that the Lord has bestowed upon us not to make those same mistakes again. But if and when we do make those mistakes, we must remember that Jesus is faithful to forgive us those mistakes as long as we are quick to confess them and strive not to do them again. And so we can see in the early stages of our spiritual childhood that we are so much like the children of Israel because just as the Lord delivered them so many times, so he does us. He forgives us and allows us to begin over with a new slate. And yet for many of us, it seems no sooner have we been forgiven and given a new slate that we have returned to the things of old all over again. And we find ourselves in the same position that not too long ago we were just delivered from. But no matter how many times we fail, let us continually return unto the Lord, broken like little children, realizing our sins, confessing our sin, and seeking our Father's forgiveness. And the second thing that we can learn from this story is that when we make a vow unto the Lord, we need to understand the responsibility of keeping that vow. And there are so many of us today that have made vows, promises, commitments unto the Lord, and we have broken them time and time and time again. And much of what we have suffered in this life has been because of those broken promises unto the Lord. The Bible tells us that it's better not to make a vow unto the Lord than to make a vow and not keep it. And so what this teaches us is we need to be very careful what we vow unto the Lord. And in the same way, we need to be very careful what we ask of the Lord. Because sometimes, as many of us know, the best gift that we can be given is an unanswered prayer. Because many of the things that we ask for are outside of his will. We ask them with selfish purposes not understanding the dangerous waters that they could lead us into if God were to answer those prayers. And that's why James tells us in our James study, be very slow to speak, but be very quick to consider. In other words, think before you speak, especially in desperate times. 
Let us be careful what we commit to the Lord if he'll only deliver us from that situation. And if we do make that vow, let us be faithful and zealous to fulfill that vow no matter the cost to us. Just like we have seen with Jephthah. He made the vow and it's going to cost his only daughter's life. He didn't have another son. He didn't have another daughter. This is his only child. But in order to be faithful unto his vow, he must offer her up as a burnt sacrifice unto the Lord. And that's exactly what he does. We see his faithfulness, his commitment, his love and devotion for God, understanding that he made a promise and now he must keep that promise. Well, that's going to bring us to the end of our lesson today, friends. The next time we're together, we're going to pick up in a very interesting story, the birth of Samson. So until we meet again, may the Lord Jesus bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. And may he guide you into pastures of beauty and enjoyment as you learn to relish in his eternal love. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.